This is what Jesus did for us. Amen. Yeah. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen. Amen. When I was broken, you were my healer. Well, you know, it says in the scriptures is without holiness, no one can see the Lord because he is so pure and so excellent in beauty. So that's what our cry is to become like him. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is 
what I need Holiness, holiness is what you want from me
Wherever you reign, Jesus.
Good morning, Grace Community Church. How's everybody? Amen. Well, at this present, we're going to go ahead and do the lighting of our Advent candle. And we have Miss Wendy and Chrissy coming. And I was trying to turn on the lights here so that we can see. Uh, here we go. 
Okay, ja. Waiting is hard in this fast-paced society. We want Christmas morning to arrive soon. We forget that before good things happen, preparations must be made. Last week, we lit the hope of prophecy candle and remembered those who first spoke the promise of the coming Christ child. The second candle on the Advent wreath is called the Faith or Bethlehem candle. Mary and Joseph's journey was a journey of faith. It is a symbol of the preparations being made to receive and cradle the Christ child. Let us pray. Most precious Heavenly Father, in the very busy season with so many things to do, Help us to hear anew your voice calling us to prepare the way for our Lord and Savior Jesus, that we, who believe, may live our lives so that all we do will point others to faith in Jesus Christ. May your Holy Spirit be with us now. Amen. Thank you, Wendy and Chrissy. Amen. Well, again, welcome to Grace Community Church. We're so glad that you have come to be with us this morning. You could have chosen to go and worship anywhere, but you are with us this morning, and we're so glad to have you. And if you are a first-time guest, we're so glad that you're with us today. And church, we always say if it's your first time, you're a guest, but if it's your second time, you're what? Family. Amen. You're family. So we're looking forward to family coming on back again to be with us again. And to our guests online, we're so glad that you've chosen to, to worship with us today. We are a 365 church. We live with purpose. We love with passion. And we lift up all people. Amen. And you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. So come on in and join with us. Y'all, we had an awesome time yesterday at the men's breakfast. Y'all, when we have a guy who has so much talent, I didn't even know that this guy even cooked like that. George blessed us yesterday. Brother George, thank you so much for that. We had an awesome time. It was so beautiful. The men came out, and, and again, as we feast so much because we're, what, a church that love to eat. The men love to fellowship. We love to have fun, and we just, we just love sharing with one another. So if you can, it is the first Saturday of every month. Men, come and join with us. It's an awesome time. Amen, church. And we have a Lord's Supper. Don't forget, following service, come on in and participate with us today, the Lord's Supper. Uh, we want to remember what, what Christ has done for us. Amen? Amen. And then we have our, y'all, oh, you can't miss this. You cannot miss this. This is going to be a beautiful time. I'm looking so much forward to it. This is our couple's Christmas, Dirty Santa, Dirty Santa. <laughs> <laughs> the name of that is just Dirty Santa. You know, the first time I heard that, I was like, oh, okay. You know, but it is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And this thing is hosted by the Moraleses. And it's going to be at the pastor's house on the, what is that, the 9th of December, Saturday. And that's at 7 p.m. And the address is there. So, guys, look, come on out and have fun. This is an awesome time. You know, that we have couples and we do that thing of just, again, food, fellowship, and fun. And we get to learn about each other. So we thank the Moraleses for hosting this thing and, uh, or pet the pastor and first lady hosting it at their house. But the leadership of this from the Moraleses, we thank you for your service. Amen. Amen. And then we have make plans to join us for our holiday feast, Sunday, December the 17th. And again, this is following the morning service you know, after we have our conference, our church conference on the 17th. It's another opportunity, what, to eat <laughs> and enjoy all of the great cooks that we have. And there's a sign-up sheet out there that several have signed up for. So make sure that you're in the house, you know, that you signed up for something, you know, and come on out and, and fellowship with us. And to you, our guest online, Come on and be a part of that. We have an awesome time when we do these kinds of things. So come and be a part of that also. 
Amen. And y'all, we are on at 5.30 p.m. December the 24th is our Christmas Eve service, which I look forward to those every year, our Christmas Eve service. We have an awesome time there. Again, and we, we are, we used to say a small church doing big things, but y'all look around, we're a big church. <laughs> we're not a small church. We're doing big things for the kingdom of God. We're partnering with him and just doing some awesome things. And we just thank you guys for the service that you guys render here at Grace Community Church. You know, and there's always an opportunity for everyone to find your place in the story of grace right here at Grace Community Church. And now I'm going to introduce y'all our, our pastor who's going to come. Say he needs no introduction, Dr. Ben Wilkins. Hey, hey uh, thank you, Ken. <clears throat> y'all, we have a, a great opportunity today to, to share in the ministry of the Gideons. The Gideons go worldwide with Bibles, and they give them out everywhere. And I, and I, I, I know I've mentioned it before, but uh, Gideon Bible was instrumental in me coming to the faith uh, in a hotel room in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. So I'll never forget picking up that Bible and reading something that caused me to keep on that journey of seeking God. I want to invite Brother Ed Justice, if you would, come. And he's going to say a word. We're going to have a brief video, and then he's going to share again. And the, you, you have an opportunity to help spread Bibles throughout the world in hotel rooms, schools, and everything. He'll tell you all about that. Thank you, Pastor Ben. Who are the Gideons? You probably know this, but just on the chance you do not, we, the Gideons are an international association of Christian businessmen and professionals. Along with our wives, our main objective is to see men, women, boys, and girls come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. We do that by handing out His Word in all the major traffic lanes of life. Uh, we minister locally, of course, but we're a worldwide organization with more than a quarter million Gideons and Auxiliary worldwide ministering in over 200 countries, territories, and possessions handing out copies of God's Word in over a hundred different languages. We are best known for the Bibles in the motels, but we also provide scriptures to schools, colleges, hotels, motels, schools, colleges, hospitals, medical offices, prisons, fire, police, as well as those in the military. Just this past year, we've been allowed to go coordinate with churches in their events such as vacation Bible schools. Last year alone, we handed out more than 56 million copies of God's Word worldwide. And you know what? Every one of those 56 million Bibles was purchased by good friends like you. And this time of year, we try to capitalize on the, birth, the uh, Christmas season because it's the birthday for Jesus. And I uh, have a little video that will explain what we're talking about. I had the nicest Christmas list that seemed to grow and grow. Lists of things I want for me and everyone I know. Toys that fly and toys that float and things to ride and roll. Toys that blink and toys that talk. To get them was my goal. My father saw the list and said, you'll have to cut this down. And how amazed was I to hear, you've left your best friend out. And so I checked the list again and said, it isn't true. But Father said, his name's not here, the one who died for you. And clearly then I understood, t'was Jesus that he meant. For him who should come first of all, I hadn't planned a cent. And though I've had to drop some names of folks I like a lot, Jesus must receive the most, his name is at the top. This Christmas, honor Christ's birth by giving the gift of His Word to men, women, boys, and girls through the Gideons International. Go to birthdayforjesus.org and make a donation for Scripture online. Thank you. On behalf of the lives that will be changed through your generosity, for celebrating Christ's birth and sharing the Word of Life with others this Christmas. Well, why would you want to give Jesus a birthday present? Think about this. If you have partaken of his gift of salvation and you're a friend of his, you know him personally, 
you're much obligated to give him a birthday present. Now, it doesn't have to be much, whatever you can afford. I'd like everybody here to participate. Let me give you some gift ideas. He wrote a bestseller, you know. A Bible for that man checking into the motel with suicide on his mind. Or a Bible for that poor student in a foreign country who's never had a Bible, never heard of Jesus. Or a Bible for that patient in the hospital that just received that death notice. Or a Bible for that prisoner facing life in prison. Or a Bible for that fireman or soldier that's putting his life on the line every day. Think about that. There's over 7.5 billion people in the world. And it's estimated conservatively that more than a third of them have never heard of Jesus, have never seen a Bible, and never heard of anything like that. So we, we're committed to putting a dent in that deficit. We have a promise from God's Word, it will not return void. Let me give you an example of that. Our camp goes every Saturday to the Bartlett Jail and shares with the prisoners that will come forward. One Saturday, there was a prisoner came forward. I'm sure it was just out of curiosity, but he didn't speak English. And we didn't know how, how to minister to him, so we just gave him a Spanish language testament. He took that and began reading it, apparently, because two weeks later he came back and he indicated that he had Jesus here and pointed to heaven with tears in his eyes. That word meant to him the Holy Spirit used that word and it's a fulfillment of the promise we have in Isaiah 55 11 my word will not return void the donation envelopes you have let me make sure everybody has one of these because I want to make sure everybody participates raise your hand if you do not have one a couple over here now, when you get that, open it up and pull the ornament inside it out. That's this thing. Lay it aside for a moment. Your donation is, of course, tax deductible. And if you want a tax receipt, just uh, put your name and address on there. We take uh, donations in the form of cash, check. I used to say money order, but you can't do that anymore. Or credit card. We take all three forms of donations now once you've done that take the ornament and I'll tell you the purpose of this ornament it is to post somewhere prominently in your home on your Christmas tree perhaps that's what it's made for or on your refrigerator or bulletin board the purpose of that is to remind you daily to pray for those that will receive the donation Bibles that you provided A couple other things I want to mention to you this morning. We have a program called the Friends of Gideons. And it just uh, is a way you can officially document yourself to receive a quarterly report of what the Gideons are doing and where they're going and how to pray for them and all that. If you're interested in that, we'll be at the door as, after the service. The other thing is, if we have anybody here that is, wants to be a Gideon, I don't know the, the makeup of your congregation, not talk to Pastor Ben, but surely there's someone here that is a businessman or a professional that would desire to be a Gideon. We'll accommodate that as well. Just see us after the program. Thanks, Pastor Ben, for your time. You're you're going to be waiting over here at with uh, to receive donations, right, Ed and, and Brother Otha? Y'all are going to be waiting over here. Yes, that's right. Okay, great. Y'all, you can <clears throat> give that to them on the way out. Uh, I don't know of much of anything you could do that's more a, a better steward of your money, really, than that. But y'all, I just want to talk to you uh, a little bit today, talk with you, because... You know, I think this is all of us learning together. You know, whenever, whenever I get in God's Word, it's all of us learning together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for your Word. We thank you for what it has done in our lives. 
Lord, we thank you that it's the message of salvation, of the gift of God to us. And Lord, we pray that you would guide our hearing and our speaking today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all, I don't know if you can get over this or not, but I can't. God came for us. He sure did. He, God showed up on this planet. And God was here. You know, God came to rescue us. You know, we were separated from God. And, and God came for us. He, he loved us so much, He didn't want us to be separated. But God was here on this earth about 2,000 years ago. And, and uh, you know, I, just being there about a year ago, and you don't have to be there. You just get a sense that He was here. Uh, and, and we are still talking about it 2,000 years later yep. that God was on this earth. Yeah. There's been nobody like Him in the history of the world who's ever been here, who's left a mark like that one life. Yeah. Um, we, we've never seen anything. Dictators, kings, I mean, uh, philosophies and stuff have tried to stamp it out and it just will not go away that God was here on this earth. Look at Matthew 2, 9. It's talking about the... Hey, here's, here's one. Uh, God put a star <laughs> on the, a, a, an extra star. He just made him an extra star. Look, it says, And the star they, the Magi, had seen in the east, guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. You know, it's such a unique... An incredible time in history of the world that God just put a special star up there. And, it, and we, we don't know much about that. We don't understand. I've, I've read some ridiculous uh, ideas of what that was and how God did that and all that. And I think God just created it just like the rest of them. He just spoke and it was there. But God had a, a special star to, to say that his son has come to this planet, that he's here. And, and so it says that, you know, the Magi, that were these, these guys that have most, in all likelihood, came from Babylon. And, uh, y'all, when, when the Jews were taken captive because of their disobedience to God, God told them that, you know, if you disobey me, and he gave them warning after warning after warning, he said, I will pluck you up from that land I've given you, and I'll scatter you throughout the earth. And so when, when God did that, and I'm, I'm talking serious stuff, you know, not just, you know, didn't go to church once in a while or something. I'm talking, talking serious sin of, of just incredibly wicked sin, even to the point of worshiping false gods and sacrificing their children to them. They got anybody's attention? Y'all, they were doing stuff like that. And God said, I've had enough. You know, and even after all that, he forgave them. And that wasn't just once. But finally, after God had put up with them for so long, he said, okay, I've had it. And so he, he let the Babylonians come in and take them captive. And you know, the, the, Israel never lost a battle to a bigger, more powerful army, except when they had turned their backs on him. You know, the size of the army coming never had much to do with whether they could win the battle or not, because God was always for them. But he told them, when you do that, I'm not going to be for you anymore. You know, but anyway, they scattered them out across the land. And some, some of those Jews were left there in the land and they've always had a presence there. In spite of what you might hear, there's always been Jews living there. But some of them were carried off to Babylon. And one of them named Daniel was carried off. And Daniel was a prophet and had a tremendous influence on these wise men. You read it in the book of Daniel. And so much so that they were conscious of the fact that the Messiah was coming. And this is 500 years later, give or take a few years, y'all. And so they are, they're coming looking for the Messiah. 
And they said, you know, we're, we're looking for one born king of the Jews. So that, that star guided them to Bethlehem. And so, uh, uh, you know, God's GPS, you know, God's perfect star uh, brought them right to, to Bethlehem. And this was a city that God had prophesied that the Messiah would be born in 500 years before it happened. And God put Joseph and Mary in there at just the right time. But look at my, my, Micah 5, 2. He says, but you, Bethlehem of Eth Ephrathah, there was two Bethlehems. So it had to be that Bethlehem. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. You know, the fact that it's from everlasting means he came from eternity. Jesus stepped out of heaven to come to this planet right here. And back to Matthew uh, 2, 9. Not only did it bring them to Bethlehem, but it brought them to the exact street address of where Jesus was at the time. And look at how the prophet Isaiah told, you know, about their birth. Now, Daniel may very well have told this to the, 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 the Magi, you know, because he had taught them and schooled them, and evidently they've passed this down for 500 years. They're looking for the Messiah, you know, and so... Uh, Daniel probably, I mean, uh, referred to uh, Isaiah. You know, we know he did to uh, the prophets as he was speaking and ministering there and all that. But uh, right before this, he talks about a, a child being born. Right before this, when he talks about a child being born of, of a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. And so he continues. And then in, in Isaiah 9, 6. Look what it says. It says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So we're talking about a child being born. And, you know, and, and look what it says. It says the government will rest on his shoulders. Yeah. See, number one, we can get government we can trust. See, this child to be born will have governing authority to act. Remember, now when, when Isaiah prophesies this, they are living in extreme gloom and doom and, and defeat and all of this. And the people are, are desperate and they're, they're being run over by a, a government that, that has come in, you know, a foreign government. And so, uh, you know, he's telling this, the government will rest on his shoulders Talking about who Jesus will be, it says the, the government will rest on his shoulders. And y'all, we, we all know something's wrong with the government. We all know that, and we all know that, that it needs to be fixed, but the only way it's ever going to be fixed is to allow this person referred to in this scripture right here to let them rule in let him rule in their hearts. And you know, uh, our government it, and all the other governments of the world are never really going to be fixed until Jesus Christ is ruling. But it's not talking about human government here. It's talking about His sovereign will over life. You know, He's the only one who can fix it. He's the only one who can really rule. Now, I'm not saying that we don't need to be involved in the political process and we need to be informed, we need to vote and all that. But, but He's the King of an eternal kingdom that will never end and the kingdoms of this world are passing away but the kingdom of God will last forever and you know he's the ruler from beginning to end he's the one who's watching over everything and ruling this world and he's the one who loved you enough to die for you he's the one who loved you enough to leave heaven and come here for us but he's Lord from beginning to the end from one end of the of time to the other. Look what Revelation 1 8 says. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, who is still to come, the Almighty One. See, we can choose to live under His authority and His reign over us, and it will go well with us. You know, that 
uh, with this loving God ruling over us. You know, in America, you know, we value so much our personal freedom and our personal autonomy, the right to rule our own lives and to be free. And sometimes we get a little carried away with that. And, you know, we forget that we are not free to make every decision we want. We are not the one who runs our lives. But it's so ingrained in us that we forget that God has a right to rule over us. I came across this quote the other day. It says, by Jim Dennison, it says, In Scripture, God is our king. Tragically, in our culture, he is our hobby. You know, but we need to ask ourselves, is Jesus our king or our hobby? You know, a hobby is something you do in your spare time. You know, it's something you like. Yeah, we, we like it. And, but we, you know, we just, it's not essential. It's not something that we absolutely have to have. We have to have him. You know, and it says the government will rest on his shoulders. So I've got a suggestion. Just resign your position as king of the world. You know, just let him, you know, let him rule our, our world and let let us just kind of forget about, you know, trying to rule our whole world and everything. You know, it'll be a lot better for us. And he's got his, his plans are so much better than ours, y'all, for, for him to rule over us and, and for us to stop scheming and manipulating and, and just let him have your very best and let it, let it all uh, rest on his shoulders, which leads us to number two. He's the counselor with a perfect plan. It says he's wonderful. He's wonderful counselor. See, when this child comes into the world, that's what he'll be called. And remember, this is given at a time when the people in dark gloom and defeat, and so much so they, they couldn't see a way out of it. But he's saying someone's coming who has a plan. Yeah. And the idea in Hebrew there is that it's incomparably superior to anything that we could ever come up with. Y'all, the Lord Jesus has a plan for your life and my life, y'all. Uh, the one who lived here for 33 years, he was attacked constantly. He lived with constant insults. He, he was hungry. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He was constantly attacked from the morning, the, from the time he got up till the time he went to bed at night. He endured all of that, and on top of that, with those, you know, blockhead disciples of his, and he just he lived with all of that without ever giving in to the temptation one time to allow the devil to have his way in our life, in his life, and he did it all with without exception. All of that so that he could just go to the cross. And die for our sins. Y'all, and that's the wonderful uh, counselor who has a plan for your life. You can trust him. Don't you think he's worthy of, of trusting his plan? You know, what, what's your plan? You know, and, and how's it going for you? But remember that quote from last, night, last week. Uh, God will only give you what you would have asked for if you knew what he knows. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't remember the guy who said it uh, this week, but, you know, that's how preachers usually do. They quote somebody and then say it, and then after a while we think we said it. Uh, but anyway, it's, you know, it, he'll only give you what you would have asked for if you already knew what God knows. He wants the very best for us. And, and look, y'all, it wasn't us that brought us where we are. You know, look at Ephesians 1.5. It says he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will. You know, it says he predestined us. That means it was his plan that brought you here. It was his plan that brought you to this place in your life. And humanly speaking, y'all, that doesn't take away your free will or anything like that. God worked it out so that you would be here you know, humanly speaking, <clears throat> it's like he had a plan and brought you to this place and he's just waiting on us to get ready for it. You know, he's, wait, he's waiting on us to, to receive him. He's waiting on us. You know, but he brought us to where we are and it was his plan, not ours, that brought us into the family of God. And so he's directing us. He's guiding us. He has this, 
this, this wonderful plan that he has for us. You know, and and uh, just saying, you know, we act like our plan got us here, but it wasn't. His plan got us into the family of God. He took us off the road to hell, and now we want him to do our plan? You know, he's, he's the one brought us here. You know, I can imagine the angels, you know, sitting up in heaven sometimes and, and saying, man, Ben Wilkins would be so embarrassed if he could see what we can see right now, trying to do his will. But uh, look, at, we all love this scripture, Romans eight twenty eight. It says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. See, God works it all for good, but it's for his purpose, not ours. You know, and he has a plan, y'all, to fix the whole world. And he's, he's got a plan to fix every problem. And it's all coming through this one child who is to be born he's, that he's telling us about here. He's got a problem that fixes everything that's wrong with the with the millions and billions of people and the millions and billions of things that go wrong. He's, he's got a problem, that, a, a plan that will fix it all. Every one of us. Every one of them. Yeah, and, and we can trust Him for that. Number three, God, He'll be God who is all-powerful. You know, and these people were so powerless, y'all. They, this invading army had come in and they were oppressed and being run over by a violent, cruel, a very, very cruel, bloodthirsty bunch of people who killed and, and extremely violent in, in the way they would just kill people and stuff and, and leave their bodies out there so everybody will see, don't mess with these people. You know, and they were living under this and, and God's telling them that uh, there's a, through the prophet that there's someone who's coming who has all power. And he's going to fix everything that's wrong. Look, it calls him mighty God. And, and y'all, this is, the kind, <clears throat> this is the kind of power that you can flaunt. You know, it, it means that. Uh, not that God needs to or anything, but it's that kind of power where, where you can just brag about it. You know, it's the kind of power that you can, you can strut around with. And, you know, we all remember somebody we were going to school, some kid that was uh, bigger than everybody else and, and he was a bully and just liked to run over people and everything until another kid came along who was bigger and meaner. But uh, it's that kind of power that he has that nothing in this universe can stop. You know, and whatever would try to stop him, you know, he created it. And he gives it life or gives it existence or something like that. So, you know, the devil is a created being. He's finite and limited in what he can do. And the only reason why he has any power at all is because we gave it to him. The human race gave it to him. But look at his power. And, and you know, Jesus is coming back someday and he's going to throw him in the lake of fire to burn forever. But look at, look at how God's power is described in Romans 1. He says, for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky and through, through everything God ma made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature so that they have no excuse for not knowing God. This verse tells us that we can look at the world around us and we can tell that there's an all powerful God and that we should. He said there's no excuse for not knowing that. That there's an all-powerful God. Just by looking at this universe that he made, we know he's, he's all-powerful. You know, for him to have eternal power, it means he's, he had just as much power after he created the world as when he did before he created the world. He didn't use any of it up. His power is eternal. That's hard for us to grasp. We can't. But, but that's who he is, y'all. He's got unlimited source of power. You know, he doesn't have to check in with anybody to, to do anything he wants, to do, wants us to do. I, I want you to take a picture of this lady. I want you to look at this picture. Uh, her name is Megan Rapinoe. She's probably the greatest woman's soccer player today and all that. She got injured and most likely will end her soccer career. And I want you to look at look into what she said. And, y'all, I'm not, I'm not doing this to make fun of this lady. I feel sorry for her. 
She said, I'm not a religious person or anything, but if there is a God, this is proof that there's not one. You know, like I said, I'm not trying to make fun of her. We don't know how she was raised. We don't know what's going on in her life. But I mean, that's the kind of stuff that's out there. Y'all, that, that people think about God. You know, and, and so God is telling us that, you know, you can look at the world and tell that there's an all-powerful God out there. And, and, you know, wouldn't it be better for her to be saying, you know, God, what do you want to teach me out of this? Now, what, what can I learn? You know, and she could probably learn something out of God that would be a whole lot better than losing her soccer career. I mean, be a whole lot better than not losing her soccer career. Y'all, but, you know, I'm just saying, let, let's pray for her. Pray for her if you think about her. But number four, we get a father who is eternal. And these people were in a terrible situation that he's, he's saying this to. And y'all, he calls him everlasting father. Y'all, they had nobody they could turn to. They were so far from God at this time that they, they probably believed that, you know, they couldn't turn to God. And they longed for a faithful father. You know, and there, there are a lot of people in this world, especially in this city in which we live, that they never knew their father. They never knew a dependable, loving father that they could turn to. And that's what everybody needs when you get in a situation like this. You need a, you need a father. And God is a perfect father that we can turn to. Y'all, when I was a little boy... Uh, I idolized my father. Yeah, I thought he was the greatest person on this earth. And my mother told me that uh, he, he, I stayed with him all the time when I was a little bitty kid, that he used to bring me to work when he'd have changed my diapers. Of course, I don't remember that. But he, that's how I stayed with him all the time. And I thought my father was the greatest. I mean, I thought he, was, he could do anything. And when I was about nine years old, my father was taken away from me. And it, it shattered my world so much that I developed asthma for a few years over that. I can remember the pain in my gut to this day of that happening to me because I didn't have my father anymore. And then a few years later, when I got, when I got saved... <clears throat> I found out I had a father. You know, I, I found out that I had a father. And, and the greatest thing to me about my personal relationship with God is that I have a father. I have a father who will, who will never leave. I have a father that I can... I'm, I'm, I'm going to see him face to face someday. But that's, that's what he meant for the, for the first time. I had a, a real father. And you have a... You have a father that you can turn to. And I don't know what kind of uh, upbringing you had or anything like that, but, but you've got a father in heaven who loves you so very much that he would send his own son for you. He loved you that much. And look, number five, we have peace that never ends. He calls him the Prince of Peace. See, these people were living in a time of War. They had no peace. And he's talking about a baby being born. And if we know one thing about babies being born, there's no peace. <laughs> you know, it, you know they're, they're a precious gift from God, you know, but, but, but they don't bring peace. Not, not for a while anyway, but he calls him the Prince of Peace and this little child who's going to be born. But he's going to be the... He's the prince of peace. He, he's the ruler of peace. He's going to be in control of peace. In other words, he can, take, he can take the peace. No one can take the peace from you. Look at in the original language, it says he's the peace of shalom. That's what, it says, that's what that says. You probably heard that word shalom. This word means to have soundness in your body, in your soul, in your mind, in your emotions, in everything, to have complete soundness about your life. Yeah. And even today, 
the Jews still, when they greet each other, they say shalom. That's what that means. They wish you to have that peace that comes from having everything together in your life, even economic peace. You know, it, it, mean, it means that, to have, a, have an all-encompassing life, you know, that, that is together. You know, it's not disintegrated. You know, when people get <clears throat> mentally ill, one of the things that happens is their personality begins to disintegrate. You know, and that's how we get schizophrenia and stuff like that. But when God comes into your life, He makes you whole. He integrates your body, your soul, your mind. And you begin to think. He renews your mind. You begin to think. And everything gets in focus. And you see life the way it should be. And you know that you've got God on His throne watching over things. So you have that that peace that passes all understanding, the Bible says, that you can have in the middle of any kind of trial, anything that's going on in your life. Look, Ephesians 2, 8, 2, 14 says, He Himself is our peace. See, Jesus is our Prince of Peace. Peace is a person. It's a person you can invite right into your life. Y'all, and it's the person of Jesus Christ. He came to make peace. Between us and God. Look at Romans 5 1 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. See, we were under, we were under the wrath of God because God is a holy, righteous God and he must judge sin. But guess what? The Bible says he's not counting anybody's sin against them because he sent Jesus to die on the cross and to pay for our sin. He said he was in Christ, not reconciling, I mean, not counting their sins against them. 2 Corinthians 5 says that. that so he, right now we live in an age of grace where we can come freely and receive that forgiveness and have peace with God. Y'all, is there something bothering you between you and God? So you can come and let Jesus be that peace that we all need. You know, and so he poured out that righteous punishment for our sins on his son. And our debt was paid. So now we can be considered righteous. He says, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done. See, we've been made right in God's sight because of that. All you got to do is believe it. Just believe that God would be that good. You know, don't, don't get hung up on whether you deserve it or not. None of us do. But see, we have peace with God because of what he's done for us. So if you'd like to talk about that later, you know, just see me or Pastor Ken or Ann or Dorothy, any of us. We could talk with you about that.